So you're all very welcome and thank you so much for joining us for today's Tea Time Talk, 14 Henrietta Street's Georgian Beginnings. Tea Time Talks is a series of talks inspired by the history and people of 14 Henrietta Street in Dublin 1. And uh, 14 Henrietta Street is a social history museum of Dublin life from one building's Georgian beginnings to its tenement times. And it's run by Dublin City Council Culture Company, who run cultural initiatives and buildings with and for the people of Dublin. My name is Kate, and if, in a few moments, I'm going to hand you over to today's speakers. But before we start, I just want to let you know that there will be a chance to ask questions at the end of the talk. Down at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button, and you can type any question or comment you have in there, and we will try to get to as many as we can at the end. So our talk today is in celebration of a book that 14 Henrietta Street has recently published, written by um, Dr. Melanie Hayes, who is with us this evening. And that book is called 14 Henrietta Street, Georgian Beginnings, 1750 to 1800. And I have a copy of it here. And you might recognise the picture on the front behind me. I'm actually lucky enough to be in the museum today, which is um, very nice. And this is one of three books that tells the story of the house in different eras, from its Georgian beginnings to its decline into a tenement house, to the last of its residents and their move to the suburbs. And they're not <coughs> academic books at all. They're really accessible if you just have a general interest in Dublin social history. So again, I can pop a link to where you can find those in the chat if you want to find out more about those later. <clears throat> Our speakers today are Dr. Melanie Hayes and Dr. Leonie Hannon. Melanie is an architectural and cultural historian specializing in Ireland's 18th century architectural and social history. She's written and spoken widely on these topics, seeking to bring historic research of national significance to a broader audience. Melanie was part of the historian research team at 14 Henrietta Street and was involved in the production of the museum's exhibition content and publication of a significant new book, a different one to this, on the architectural and social history of Henrietta Street called The Best Address in Town, Henrietta Street, Dublin and its first residence, 1720 to 1780. And she currently works as a postdoctoral research fellow on an Irish Research Council Advanced Laureate Project, Craft Value at Trinity College Dublin, and continues to be involved with the museum as an historian for 14 Henrietta Street. And Leonie Hannon is a senior lecturer at Queen's University in Belfast in the field of social and cultural history. Her work focuses on Ireland and Britain in the 18th century, and her interests include gender, material culture, intellectual life, and histories of home. Her books include Women of Letters, Gender, Writing, and the Life of the Mind in Early Modern England, and the forthcoming A Culture of Curiosity, Scientific Inquiry in the 18th Century Home. And this evening, they're going to be taking you through the story of these earliest years of the building's existence with a particular focus on the lives of the women who called it home. And just to flag before we begin that um, the, um, Melanie will shortly be sharing her screen. There may be a little bit of interference from some of the Zoom toolbars on the screen. And we noticed when we were practicing just now, so fingers crossed that won't happen. It shouldn't interfere too much, but just to let you know that you might see some of that. So Melanie and Leonie, over to you. And thank you, Leonie, uh, for joining me tonight to talk about 14 Henrietta Street's Georgian beginnings um, and to talk about the new book, which I have mm. written uh, about this very topic. Um, 14 Henrietta Street was built in the late 1740s during a boom in Dublin's building industry. This followed a decade of war and economic hardship at home and abroad. Um, and, Hen and 14 Henrietta Street formed part of a row of three houses, which were built at this time by Luke Gardner um, on the south side of the street, which we can see here, from about 1747. Up until then, um, these would have been vacant lots, and I can imagine it would have been a real eyesore to the rest of the residents, uh, which had lived on the street since the 1730s. Anyone who's visited the museum will have felt the impact of this building. Uh, of its lofty red brick facade, rising four stories high, you see here, almost 50 feet wide, punctuated by these elegant sash windows filled with hand-spun crown glass. You will have felt the frizzen, the sense of anticipation as you step through the broad carved stone doorcase. 
into what were once very sumptuous spaces within. Inside, though much of the rich decorative finishes and furnishings no longer remain, we can still get a sense of the original grandeur in the sheer scale of the spaces, in the height of the ceilings and the breadth of the rooms, in the quality as well of the light, the open airiness of these great spaces. For me, there's also a sense of occasion in the elegant sweep of the stair, marking out your progress as you rise upwards. Then the moment of arrival as you enter the first floor rooms, glimpsing through the door at the remnants of the finely crafted interiors which still survive today. Although much has changed in terms of its space and its function over the course of almost 300 years, the very fabric of this building, its walls, its floors, its doors and ceilings still preserve a trace of its past. Well, thanks, Melanie, so much for giving us that introduction to 14 Henrietta Street, which we're going to spend a little bit more time with tonight. But as we sit here, as ever, on Zoom, and for those of us in the audience perhaps who haven't had a chance to visit the house in person, I wondered if you could give us a little bit of an idea about the scale of this interior space. Clearly, so we were coming up that, sweeping up that staircase there, but where are we going into and what are these rooms like once you're inside? Well, as I say, you're right, in terms of scale, this is a huge, grandiose structure, um, double height entrance from stair hall, um, which only rises to the first floor of the building, where we have reception rooms, which we'll talk about a little later on this evening, um, where they would have uh, carried out um, social functions um, uh, for guests of the 18th century. Something I find that really strikes visitors uh, when they uh, come to the museum is the scale of this space, but really that it was built to house a single family, uh, of course, and their attendant staff. And it's the people who populate this space, which are really of prime interest. Um, and Georgian in Beginnings, uh, the book which we can see here, not only focuses on the uh, early history of this building and um, its construction, its fit out, how it functioned, but it also explores the lives that were lived uh, behind this elegant Georgian facade. Um, so we'll meet a few of the people perhaps now. Um, first resident, Viscount Richard Molesworth, a noble military man who moved to Henrietta Street late in his life, um, requiring this ample sized house to accommodate his young wife and their growing family, but also in a grandeur that befitted his rank as he was a Viscount. Um, John Bowes, the next resident, an English judge who purchased 14 Henrietta Street about 1758 in the wake of his promotion to the office of Lord Chancellor of Ireland. And here, if we um, believe Mary Delaney's portrait of his gout-ridden state, he succumbed to the uh, excessive habits, let's say, of the native elites. Or Malaysia resident, Sir Lucius Henry O'Brien, politician, landowner who moved here about the time of his marriage in 1768. He too needed a convenient town base uh, where he would carry out his parliamentary duties when not ensconced in the rural tranquility of his house at Dromoland, County Clare. But we've seen the men. What about the women who populated these spaces? I think we're interested in these tonight, Leonie, the wives and mothers uh, and daughters uh, who are now somewhat shadowy figures, but in the 18th century played a really integral and then really visible role in running these elite houses. You can see here Lady Mary Molesworth, whose portrait uh, you'll have noticed graces the cover of the book and um, hangs behind Kate in the museum, and Mrs. Anne O'Brien, or Nancy, as she was always known. And I hope that we can sort of pry and draw out their experience of this domestic space and um, of their lives, both public and private. So from my understanding, um, these women's marriages look quite different, but could you tell us a little bit more about perhaps the circumstance, their own circumstances during their time in Henrietta Street? Well, 
their, their circumstances do seem quite different to us when you first uh, look at them. Someone like Lady Mary Molesworth, we see here, a renowned beauty who at the age of 15 married a Viscount some 40 years her senior. Now she might seem really remote to us, but actually when you look at it, look into it, we see the same course of events, births, marriages, deaths, marked out the stages of her life. She too was anxious for the safe delivery of her children and the health of her children, particularly the spread of infectious diseases. And that's all we'll say about that tonight. Um, she and her husband were perhaps just as concerned as we are about their own health and wealth and their job security. And so when writing this book and researching these individuals, what really struck me most about the women and the men was not how different they are to us, but actually the universal nature of their experiences. Absolutely. So I guess, um, yeah, I'd like to, well, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about some of these different life stages. But I suppose before we do that, I wanted to know a little bit more, Melanie, about your research process, especially in uncovering the lives of these women, um, as opposed to perhaps their quite well documented lives of fathers, husbands and brothers. Um, what was it like to try and um, to try and uncover these lives that have been less well preserved in the archive? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, recovering women's histories from this period in particular and in Ireland in particular uh, can be somewhat challenging. Um, and in many cases, we only have quite a fragmented picture in terms of evidence. Uh, we're really lucky um, in terms of 14 Henrietta Street, that two of the um, first original female residents that we have portraits for them and we actually know quite a bit about them. And many of the other women who lived on this street in the 18th century and um, we don't even have a surviving portrait, so we don't know what they look like. Um, let's say evidence of women's lives, even elite women um, in the 18th century, is somewhat thin on the ground. At this time, uh, no respectable woman would be mentioned in the public press, except, of course, announcements of births, marriages and deaths. Um, and when they're mentioned in public records, it's often only in terms of their male relatives, so a wife, daughter, sister, so-and-so. Um, mm. And then in other commentary, they're often remarked upon for their appearance, their accomplishments. So Lady Molesworth, for instance, was known as a very great beauty whose character and virtue were beyond suspicion. So it doesn't tell us much about it, but we can still recover something of their histories um, through anecdotal sources, letters and diaries. And Leone, I know that you have um, great experience uh, in this area. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I've, I've worked um, when I've been looking at women's lives, I've worked primarily on English sources. And, and, and it has to be said, there are more of them for this era and these kinds of women, for sure. But I mean, in general, it can be uh, the process of reconstruction of female lives. I think it can feel like an uphill struggle. Mm -hmm. I when I was looking for um, women's letter writing initially in my early research, I, I would it was very hard to look for individual themes that you might be interested in. I often found myself just searching under misses to see if any letter writing came up in any archive. Um, so there is a sense that, you know, the sort of textual evidence of women's lives has sometimes been, you know, lost, mislaid, or even forgotten in some ways. Um, and, you know, what you really want is that qualitative material, which really, the sort of personal information about people's lives people speaking their own voice but what my sense is and this is probably where you your research expertise comes in Melanie is that you know it's lovely when we can find diaries and letters but we can also piece other we can infer things from other kinds of evidence whether that's buildings and architectural evidence whether that's visual culture whether that's objects that people owned or bequeathed and so my sense is that there are you know creative ways that we can draw together and draw on you know different specialisms people who work more with paintings or with buildings or with um, museum collections to um to begin to learn a lot more than perhaps we thought we could so I wondered um on this basis that, um whether you found any glimpses of these women's personal perspectives on life you know how has anything survived in the archive in the case of these women yeah, well as I say actually for uh, 14 Henrietta Street we do have uh, quite a bit of information uh, comparatively speaking um for Nancy O'Brien or Anne O'Brien to give her a proper name and um, we get a rare glimpse into this uh, female perspective 
uh, in her memoir on married life. Um, so it's like a diary or a journal, um, which brings wonderful colour to her story. And we actually get the chance to hear her own voice, um, which is, is quite rare. Um, uh, Anne or Nancy was described as a very pleasing and very affable woman who has been very handsome. So that's the only real official description of her. But from her memoir, we learn that, well, for one, she was really besotted with her husband, Sir Lucius O'Brien, as you can see here. And um, to her, he was the best of men, and she was the happiest of wives. Uh, somewhat rare for this time, um, this marriage seems to have been a love match. Um, and we hear this in Nancy's uh, own voice when she writes of her husband. She says, where is there within my knowledge such a man? None can know his heart as I do, who have the happiness of being his wife. And we learn from her own words that she was constantly at her husband's side when we visited London, London, Bath, uh, Dublin, sorry, London, Bath. And she supported him in his public and his private endeavours, even though, as her memoirs make clear, she would much have rather stayed in the peace um, and tranquility of their country estate in Clare. What's also really wonderful um, is we have some letters from uh, Sir Lucius O'Brien to his wife, and these show that the affection uh, was reciprocal. Uh, when they were parted, uh, Sir Lucius pined for his wife's company. He wrote, the truth is, my own Nancy has made home so dear to me that I do not find relish the places in which she is absent. So uh, a real love story there. It's quite touching, isn't it? It's lovely when you find those little um, yeah. personal words. Um, but I just want to shift focus now and think again um, back to the house itself. Um, you know, but this time perhaps more in terms of its diverse social functions. We we sometimes think of, I guess, homes as either kind, you know, as kind of inherently um, closeting and enclosing and private. But of course, these great big Georgian townhouses played a really massive public role. And I wondered if you could talk us through that kind of side of their function just now. Yeah, sure. Well, so practically speaking, these townhouses um, provided convenient city bases um, in the 18th century for politicians and professionals uh, where they could conduct their affairs after hours during um, the parliamentary season. Now, this only happened every two years. So essentially, these houses were temporary or seasonal residents. Um, but these domestic spaces were much more than mere shelter. Uh, in a century where show was essential and taste was king, the house in town provided the ideal vehicle uh, with which to display one's wealth and your status and your cultivated tastes to the world. And houses like 14 Henrietta Street served as really very public arenas, as we say, Leone, and um, suitable abodes for which Ireland's landed gentry um, could use to enjoy the delights of the social season. And um, this, of course, ran through the winter months uh, from Michaelmas, which is sometime around end of October, November, uh, to St. Patrick's Day. The Irish High Society would abandon their country estates for the pleasure of the city. Um, and during this time, these really grandly scaled houses served as settings for hospitable display, social scheming, places to conduct business, stages in which political intrigues and promotions played out. Um, also, young couples often took a house in town uh, upon marriage, and they too used these spaces to establish their position in society. We know that Nancy and Sir Lucius O'Brien moved to Henrietta Street about the time of their marriage, uh, though their wedding actually took place at Nancy's father, uh, Robert French of Monavay's house in Dublin. So very much public spaces um, in the public arena. Okay. Well, thanks very much. I mean, if we could just move on to this idea of young couples and marriage, um, I guess marriage is just obviously an incredibly important junction in, juncture in life. And it was then as it is now, possibly more so then. And for the elites, besides the typical concerns about making a good match for perhaps dynastic or financial reasons, this was, of course, a moment of considerable material acquisition. So couples really engaged. I'm in my understanding, in this sort of rite of passage of decorating and filling their home with, in this case, pretty expensive, fashionable goods, right? So women have been associated, of course, for many, many years with this act of shopping. 
Um, and since it, you know, since it became a thing, really, which is more or less in this period. But um, some of this reputation, I think, between of, as, of women as shoppers is just attributable to a kind of sexist stereotype about women as being kind of materialistic. But when women, you know, women did shop and elite women certainly did. And they often went together with their husbands, too, who were often equally invested in the kinds of acquisitions being made at this time, you know, the setting up of home. But with a house like 14 Henrietta Street to decorate, there was just huge scope for embracing new products and fashions, I would imagine. Um, and I wondered, yeah, I wondered if you got any hint of that. Um, you know, the house is pretty empty when you visit it today, certainly of its 18th century um, furniture and that kind of furnishing. But I wondered if you could tell us anything more about um, what what they bought and what they put in that house on marriage? Well, unfortunately, we don't, as you say, the actual spaces don't preserve the original furnishings. Um, and we have mm. little evidence as to what they were in those physical spaces. But we can get a sense from other houses and again, from letters and diaries, um, the sort of uh, material objects and possessions uh, which we furnished these spaces. We get a little hint of the rich, sumptuous uh, decor in this satirical image here uh, by William Hogarth, Marriage Alamode. Mode. And um, as I say, it is satire, but it really does give us um, a very strong impression of the glitz, the glamour um, with which mm. a, a young married couple would have furnished their houses. Again, this is all about display, about showing off your tastes. And as you say, Leone, uh, men as well as women uh, wanted to create the grand figure uh, to borrow from Toby Bernard. In terms of who was responsible, um, again, letters and diaries and account books, personal account books, make clear that elite women were fundamental to the actual creation of these domestic spaces, um, even though sometimes the official record doesn't show this. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it was often uh, the women's diaries or marriage portions that provided the means of financing an urban establishment such as this. Absolutely. So in terms of, I mean, in this brilliant image, we get a sense of the glitz and the glamour, the taste and all the wonderful things that fill these sorts of homes. But we also get that sense of the public space, these large spaces for entertaining and, and this, you know, almost the, the also the fact that it is a home, we have someone sort of somewhat collapsed with their pet, pet dog in the, in the foreground here. So I wondered if you could say anything more about this public role in this private space and, you know, grey areas in between. Absolutely. And this is particularly pertinent when we're thinking about the role of women in these spaces. Um, the lady of the house, she was at once the wife and mother, the mistress of the household and a society hostess. Um, and these elite women were really required to negotiate the blurred boundaries between the private sphere of domestic life and the public worlds of their husbands. Um, they would say their household manager, um, the wife's duties would have included hiring and management of household servants and staff, um, but also management of domestic expenditure. Um, as I say, women's uh, names may not always appear on bills or invoices uh, in the public record, but it seems it was often the lady of the house that actually commissioned these purchases. Um, at the same time as running the house over the nuts and bolts of the operation, these genteel females would also have acted as society hostesses. Um, we're looking here again at uh, Lady Molesworth, who despite her youth would have masterminded the frequent social events which took place uh, at Henrietta Street in the grand public rooms of this house. Say from taking tea with the ladies in the parlor to receiving afternoon callers in the drawing room, or planning and hosting evening entertainments, dinners, dances. Uh, for these, menus had to be drawn up, provisions ordered, in consultation mm -hmm. with the housekeeper, invitations issued, servants instructed for the smooth running of what were really highly orchestrated occasions, and um, rooms made ready to receive the invited company. And all this before the lady of the house would be called upon to dazzle those that assembled with her beauty and her accomplishments. We can see uh, some of Lady Mary's here and her fine manners. And it was this that gave these occasions the air of gentle refinement uh, so desired. 
when you think of the scale of the house um, and the sort of layer, the strata of society that were being entertained there, you political machinations, who knows what's going on in that room. Um, putting these occasions on was really no small task. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about these fabulous parties, Melanie? Well, say hospitality was absolutely, absolutely essential uh, to these uh, elite people's lives, to maintaining their social standing, as well as a uh, political position in the 18th century. And their houses were very much stages uh, on which the public sphere or business shaded into pleasure. Um, and during the season, as I say, which uh, ran through the winter months, these townhouses would regularly have hosted evening parties or roots, as they were known. And these were really increasingly elaborate affairs, packed with people and opportunities to see and be seen. Um, we're looking at a bare interior here, but we have to try and imagine um, from the moment the guest arrived into these elegant, softly lit entrance walls where musicians would have heralded their arrival. String quartet accompanied their progress up the grand stair to the reception rooms where the host or hostess would have been waiting to greet them uh, and the assembled company. And um, you can see here at number 14 Henrietta Street, one of the first floor rooms. And this house, like many uh, other mid-century townhouses, contained a series or circuit of interconnecting reception rooms. And these were fitted out with the greatest degree of splendor and expense of any area of the house. We see here some of the surviving decorative features from the front drawing room. Um, and it just gives us a hint at the original splendor of uh, these spaces. I mean, when we... When we imagine these spaces, that was so hard because, of course, they would have been so hugely populated with furniture to facilitate this entertaining, whether it's seating, card and games tables um, and all sorts of things. So to create that kind of social scene, I guess. And this is really entertaining with a capital E, isn't it? Oh, that's a wonderful image. That's just exactly what I was trying to conjure up there. It's hard to and, you know, room. Yeah, exactly. And it's so busy and busy full of people and music and sounds and of course all sorts of um important social political business conversations taking place no doubt in that space as well you know probably quite a few deals were done at the card table mm -hmm. and and when we think about you know all the stuff where it's being drawn from you know these are the trade routes of empire things being coming all the way to chat from china over into this dublin townhouse but at the same time, you know, local craftspeople trying to imitate some of those um, techniques that have become so popular, like porcelain, lacquerware, all these kinds of considered exotic kind of um, um, processes and uh, material goods. So in a way, looking at the space links you not only to the artisan perhaps in China, or in India making some of these goods, or the artisan down the road, perhaps in the Liberties in Dublin. But it also links you right up to the sort of world of high politics um, and the sorts of things that were going on, the power dynamics of parliament at this time. So yeah, I just I, I think this image really brings brings this this space to life in that sense, isn't it? And brings to you the kind of noise and hubbub of this space. Absolutely. Um, similar perhaps not quite so packed illustration, mm. um, which I can, again think is quite useful um, to show that the noisy and packed nature of these affairs and to try and you know, imagine yourself in the room, think about the, the hum of voices all competing with the melodious tones of chamber music or the music of friends as it was known. And um, think about the clinking of crystal glasses and chinking of silver forks on plates. Um, I'm trying to imagine the spectacle that would have filled these rooms, the crush of people in their fine silk clothing, the men in their powdered wigs, the women can't necessarily see it here in this image, but with increasingly large and flamboyant headdresses and all engaged, as you say, Leone, in different social activities, some dancing, some playing cards, others just engaged in the tete-a-tete. Um, so they were really um, so very dynamic sort of entertainments. They were also, uh, would have been eating an impressive array of refreshments and um, were served during these uh, soirees, often on little tables or trays. 
And Mrs. Delaney describes one such uh, event in 1731, and she notes how delicacies such as sweetmeats, which were items of confectionery, chocolate, sago, jelly, and salvers of all sorts of wine were placed before the seated company on little Japan boards. Um, so very exotic affairs. Do you think, considering, I mean, considering what this must have looked like, um, you know, the visual kind of appeal of it, do you think the quality, do you think that was the main element or do you think the quality of the food was also really important at these these events or, or perhaps maybe a combination of the two? Perhaps maybe a combination, yeah, probably a combination of both. I don't have a suitable image to show the decadence of dining, um, but Irish elites uh, certainly had a reputation for putting on a good spread, food and drink. Um, when he came here from England in the 1720s, mm. John Bowes, who lived here at 14 Henrietta Street, professed his astonishment, um, and I quote, over the profuseness of the Irish tables. He wrote to a friend, this was a national vice for people not infrequently ate themselves out of house and home. And um, so to say, quite the reputation for stuffing ourselves as one other uh, English person noted. Um, and formal dining uh, would have frequently taken place in these spaces, usually mm. in the late afternoon. Um, and these events lasted for several hours. We know that at least two courses were served, often many more, and each course comprised of uh, as many as 20 or more covers of dishes and they would have been set out all at once in these elegant arrangements complete with fine Irish linen, silver plate mm. and crystal glassware. Um, we also have hints about the sort of food they would have eaten and mm. um, really unusual, some really unusual dishes, uh, fricassee of frogs, cod's tongues which I think sounds bizarre and badger flambe with cauliflower was sort of at one um, Irish table. So really quite elaborate. Well, that's, I mean, that just gives us a bit of a picture just there. So why don't we move now from this like noisy, celebratory kind of dining table to a more intimate and some of the more, more intimate and I guess private spaces of, of the home? Um, absolutely. Well, we don't have to move too far. Um, at number 14, as in many of these houses, the first floor also contained a small antechamber or cabinet which was connected to these larger drawing rooms. And here I think we start to see the boundaries between public space or entertainment spaces and private start to blur a little bit. And um, because these are both intimate spaces for private reflection, but also sometimes ceremonial bedchambers that we see presented here. Um, which were semi-public areas uh, in which you would receive your um, more close acquaintance. We're also looking here, the close-up of the beautifully carved bed uh, made by an, Ar an Irish carver, a man called John Kelly. Uh, so we're seeing some native craftsmanship here. And it was made uh, for Dr. Moss, a male midwife and the master of the Lyme Eden Hospital, which is now the Rotunda in Dublin. And those who have visited the museum, I think, will agree um, that this room is a really um, evocative, but particularly emotional moment in the journey through the house. It features Paul and Ian reading a beautiful poem, This Bed, and showing you a few extracts from the poem here, which really highlight the fraught dangers of childbirth, the great leveller. Um, and indeed, again, it highlights another one of the more private functions which took place throughout the history of this house and um, we'll chat a little bit more about that I think in a moment. Uh, before we do uh, we might think a little bit about uh, where people actually slept. Um, these sleeping quarters, bed chambers would have been found generally in the upper stories of the house in the 18th century and they would mm. have included not just bed chambers um, often separate ones for men and women um, but also their adjoining dressing rooms uh, and closet spaces, dark closets. I think we can all uh, picture what these would have been used for. Mm. Um, so say these were much more private spaces. 
I mean, I just find the I find the closet. I've always found the closet a really interesting space. It is in some ways it can be considered a, a dressing room, a sort of a personal space in that way. But it's not always just that. Sometimes these smaller rooms, sort of antechambers or spaces, just off the main traffic of the household, we use for all sorts of slightly quieter activities, reading and writing, even sometimes entertaining a close friend. And I mean, there's been a lot of work on on closets, and I've I've been really interested to see little re- references to them in my in my own research you know um and yeah far from them just being a space to dress you know for example I, I, I looked at um, a woman who a sort of marched an living in Bedfordshire around the same time and when she stayed at a friend's house she took possession of that lady's closet which she then which then began to describe and she said you know papers and books are strewn all over the floor you know there's I can hardly find space basically and you know, showing that there was some really heavyweight reading materials sort of resting on the desk and in this space. And I think this sort of emphasises that even though we sometimes um, have an idea or a notion of how people use different spaces in the home, that people often use them, you know, for their own interests as well. And certainly a space that was a little bit more private um, and away from the hubbub of the main house. So I guess um, thinking a little bit more about some of these secluded spaces of the home, can you tell us anything about women in terms of um, this process of lying in before childbirth um, and, and whether we know anything about how that worked at Henrietta Street? Well, we know a little about it. Um, so the lying in um, or confinement, uh, as it's known, um, well, it wasn't only elite women, but for the elite women that occupied this space in the 18th century, mm-hmm. um, they would have travelled to town, to these townhouses for the period of their confinement and uh, lying in, in order to avail of more expert and hands-on uh, medical care. And 14 Henriette Street um, was the setting for quite a number of births in the 18th century and, of course, the centuries beyond. Um, Lady Mary Molesworth, Um, who we've already heard, the much younger wife of Viscount Richard Middlesworth, had eight children in total, and two of them were born here uh, at 14 Henrietta Street. And we can see a copy here of the newspaper uh, advertisement in September uh, 1751, um, soon after they moved to the house, um, notifying people that Lady Mary uh, had delivered a daughter, uh, Elizabeth. Um, You can see the portrait here. Um, and Elizabeth was followed four years later by her sister Charlotte. Nancy O'Brien as well also came to town on several occasions for her lying in. Her eldest daughter Nicola was born here in 1769, mm. um, as well as her uh, eldest son and the heir, uh, Edward, who was born at 14 Henrietta Street in 1773. I mean, this is just a really fascinating area. I'm sure we could talk for a great deal of time about it. I'm a bit conscious of our time um, now, M- Melanie. And I just, w- I just wondered, I mean, of course, lying in, lying in and the whole notion of it is so intriguing when, you know, many women today will be working right, and many women, you know, who did work in the 18th century will be working right up to the moment, you know, the contractions start. But I wondered if we might also, we might now have a little think um, about the sort of, motherhood as a kind of life stage before we we end up um towards the end of these women's lives and and how 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 what, what was elite motherhood like in this period well sure um well as i say these were these were spaces for birth this is where um women would have had their lying in and um, we've noticed a fraught and dangerous process yeah. um and the babies often quite soon after they were born um, would have been um, taken away from their mothers um, and into, put into the hands of wet nurses and of um, uh, nursery maids. Um, the recent research by Emma O'Toole into maternity and child's birth, which Emma has really, really generously shared with us uh, for tonight, um, has shown the processes of um, the lying in or confinement, uh, the fraught nature of it, but also um, in some ways the um, social nature of confinement. I'm just showing you briefly here um, an image of taking coddle, um, which I was really fascinated to learn about, as I say, in Emma's research, um, yeah. where female guests would have visited the confinement or lying in rooms both before and after the birth of the baby. And they were served celebratory cake um, and coddles, fortifying yeah. um, post-labor drink. 
Um, but to say the babies would have generally been taken away quite quickly um, from mm. their mothers and given over to the uh, wet nurse primarily um, so the mother could conceive again as quickly as possible and return to uh, her husband's side. Absolutely. It's such, I mean, it's so fascinating, this period of life and um, some of the differences between, you know, experiences of motherhood to this day. But I did want to, before we um, close up our discussion, Melanie, and before we open the floor for a few questions, I did want to skip because I'm really interested also in older age and women, because I feel like so much of the focus of um you know, historians' attention has gone on these these moments in life, such as you know, childhood, marriage, and motherhood and child rearing. That so little attention has been given to older age and what that brought. Um, and I wondered if you could talk us through a little bit about this life stage and perhaps, in particular, widowhood for for the kinds of women who lived in Henrietta Street. Yes. Um, so I'm showing you here. Um, an image of the back stairs at Henrietta Street um, as a liminal zone within the house. But I think this also speaks of the position of um, the widow uh, in a late 18th century society. Now, the death of their husbands, loss aside, uh, signaled uh, significant changes in the lives and the living arrangements of these women. Um, their new status, they were neither wife anymore nor spinster. Um, and it was quite visibly marked out, not only in terms of their dress and the wearing of mourning rings and other jewellery, um, but also, it seems, in the houses themselves. Um, we know that when her husband, William Connolly, died, the Speaker of the House of Commons, um, who died in 1729, his wife, Catherine, decorated their Capel Street house with black fabric, hung it um, on all the reception rooms and in the staircase. Um, so really shows... Um, her mark, visibly marking out this new stage in her life. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, some of the studies have shown that women lower down the social scale could gain a moment, you know, the possibility of autonomy in widowhood if they inherited a business. This is some, some of the only circumstances that women could, you know, um, be in, in control of a business and own property in that way. But for many elite women, it was that was much less likely to be the case, um, it seems, and often then um, that, that life stage would kind of entail a whole deal of shifts and perhaps the influence of other male family members. Yes, absolutely. Uh, certainly in terms of property and inheritance, yeah. Um, yeah. because although we, the widows would have been uh, provided for financially with widows joint, uh, jointure, um, and they might have been given a life interest in more movable mm. property, furniture, plate, etc., um, often the hereditary home or real estate passed to the eldest male. Um, townhouses like 14 Henrietta Street, which were often leased, tended to be sold or passed on. Um, though some wi uh, widows did retain um, a life interest in these spaces. But we have found um, in the case of both Mary Molesworth um, and uh, Nancy O'Brien that this was not the case, that they did move on uh, from Henry Etta Street um, following their husband's deaths. And their stories are actually really quite poignant. Um, so we might just really briefly think about them. Um, Mary Molesworth, um, on the death of her husband, uh, Richard, in 1758, uh, moved with her family, um, her ch young children, to London. And here she uh, really met a very tragic end. Uh, only five years later, 1763, a fire broke out of her house on Upper Brook Street. And she and two of her daughters, uh, Mary and Melusina, and six servants died in that fire. Uh, three of her other daughters uh, only survived because of the brave actions of their mother, uh, who broke the upper windows and threw mattresses into the street. So really tragic uh, end to her life. Uh, and indeed her widowhood. Um, Nancy O'Brien, maybe not quite so uh, dramatic. She also moved to Bath in England uh, with her three unmarried daughters following her husband's death. Um, Sir Lucius O'Brien, which we see here, died at Dremoland uh, in 1795 after a period of ill health. Um, and the entry in Nancy's diary uh, at the end of that year really shows the love and the loss uh, that she suffered. Um, and I think it is quite a fitting um, 
if rather poignant note uh, to finish up uh, the main part of our discussion tonight. Um, and I'll just read what she wrote. Um, Spent this year, the last happy one of my life, in the midst of my family at dear Dremoland, surrounded with every blessing. Ever the first of all of them, the improved health of my dearest husband towards winter. It was a gleam of sun within a cloud, which alas, too soon set forever and left his sisters and the happiest of wives and mothers to be left by God's appointment, a mourning and wretched widow. Oh, that is a poignant note to end on. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, pleasure talking to you about this, Melanie, and I wish we had a lot more time, but I'm also really keen that we have a chance to hear any questions from um, from your audience today. So I think I'm going to hand back over to Kate now just to um, field the question and answer. Yeah, and just to echo what Leone said, thank you so much, um, Melanie, for that brilliant presentation and, and to you, for uh, Leone, for the um, wonderful conversation that you've both had really, really interesting, could spend hours listening to the two of you. Um, but we do have some questions in. Um, the first one is from Orla, and she says, Dr. Hayes, could you explain where and how you found things like the letters and memoirs? Well, the memoir for Nancy O'Brien um, is preserved at Trinity College in the Manuscripts Department, and um, I've been studying and then working there for many years, so would have enthralled um, through um all of their holdings and um, other archives in Ireland and actually a lot in England because our records are really quite thin on the ground for the 18th century in Ireland. Of course, we lost so much in the um, public records uh, office fire in the 20th century. And um, so as I say, a lot of trawling through archives, as uh, Leonie said earlier, keyword searches are really helpful. Um, and there are published uh, letters and diaries as well, and um, accounts such as um, Mary Delaney's are just wonderful um, for recovering this um, kind of elite female perspective. But it's it's a, a tapestry almost, you know, you're finding scraps of information here and there and trying to weave uh, a clearer picture of their lives together. I'm not sure if that's a similar uh, approach that you might have taken, Leonie. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in some ways you feel like it's extremely difficult to pull the fragments together. But in other ways, I sometimes feel like there's so much that's sitting there in archives. But because it was um, one of the problems is that archives um, were catalogued with with certain views in mind about what was important and what wasn't. So you often find fascinating things under MISC is my experience. Um, so they're there to be yeah, read, but they're, they're often hard to find. Uh, certainly, when Nancy's diary is a real gem. Um, I didn't have time to uh, discuss more her role as a, a mother, but this has some real gems in terms of her pearls of wisdom that she uh, passed down to her children. Uh, her daughter, Nicola, who was inclined towards uh, indolence, she was uh, cautioned against this. Her son, um, Edward, prone to self-indulgence, and she said all of them were to guard against a waste of time as the bane of happiness. So, so it is possible to find these little scraps um, and traces of these women's voices. Wow, thank you. Uh, another question here, it's come uh, two or three actually um, in one. Uh, it's from Marie, she says, hi, I have Melanie's beautiful book and I would like to know more and relate more to all these women. Wondering about Louisa Molesworth or Mrs. Ponsonby, and if she was related to the famous Miss Ponsonby of Flangotlin, and was Lady O'Brien related to Susan O'Brien, the good friend of Sarah Napier, um, and also whether the houses were their principal residences or only occupied during the parliamentary season? Um, good questions. Uh, Lady Louisa Ponsonby of Molesworth. My understanding, now she could very well be also related to the um, Hanson Basin, if I find this here, of Lagoan, La um, but my understanding is she's also related to the Hanson Bees that held uh, lands in um, Kenny, um, Earls of Besborough. But all of these um, uh, elite families in Ireland and in Britain, um, they were so interconnected 
Well, intermarried, we're talking at a really small part of people. So it is very likely that all of the individuals that you named are um, actually related. Um, Susan O'Brien, I believe she is related, but I don't know the, um, the nature of that relationship. The family trees alone could uh, take an entire you know, research career to try and understand. Um, but they were all close, not just in terms of blood relationships, but they would have um, uh, formed bonds and um, visited each other. Um, so yeah, they were closely connected in real terms as well. What was the last part of that question? Oh, was it the principal residence? Yeah. Um, the houses um, at Henrietta Street certainly um, were, they were town residences. So they were principally to be occupied during a uh, parliamentary season and say this only took place every two years. So you do find in some of uh, certainly later Dublin, um, George, Dublin's Georgian squares and streets, Marion Square, as it would have just been hired for the season. Uh, that's not necessarily the case of Henrietta Street. These people tended to own them permanently. And um, so they might have actually occupied them more regularly than just when Parliament was sitting. Um, but during the summer months, when um, uh, temperatures rose, um, the stench of the city rose, and also infectious diseases, the landed gentry all tended to kind of decamp from the city, as is the case um, in Britain, um, and go to their country houses for the, um, the fresh air and respite. And is it true to say that beds like the, the bed that you um, showed us earlier, um, made by John Kelly, that was almost like a... Oh, like a proto IKEA flat pack type thing. Would they take their furniture with them? It's funny, actually, with beds. They did certainly move, and I don't know if you found this too, Leonie, but they certainly seem to move possessions between town and country quite fluidly. Um, and you do see in inventories, so they are quite rare, where there'll be mention of OX oh, is in town, but it actually belongs in the country. Um, beds were quite a high value item um, so even though it does pack down I don't know how often it would have been moved um, there was a quote uh, from number 14 no, sorry 15 Henrietta Street um, the um, Earl of Kingston's mother um, saying you know he could have all the furniture but not her bed she was taking her bed out of the house uh, and moving it to her own residence so they you know they wouldn't necessarily have been moved yeah, a huge traffic of smaller items. I mean, I've been surprised to see requests for a particular like ceramic pot from a town residence or country resident. And you sort of think these in this huge and wealthy establishments, you think there would be, do you know what I mean, that there would be more than one of these. But yeah, so things were moved up and down. I think there's a long term trend around beds as well that in the early modern period and certainly if you went back to say the 16th century they are the expensive thing that people buy when they get married this is where all the money goes right on this bed and it occupies you know very high status and there are famous examples of extremely elaborate versions of this right um but there are as the most moment, expensive items in an inventory so that's it. Yeah, that's it. And I, my understanding is that but maybe you, you would know better, Melanie, that by the time we get into the 1800s, it's possible that it's overtaken in a large household by a dining table and the dining tables are beginning to compete. Absolutely. I was going to say that. You start to yeah. see that even towards the end of the 18th century when di the dining room really gets a, a fixed position within the house and uh, sort of um, all the accoutrements that go with it. Yeah. Dining tables, sideboards, a multitude of chairs, as you said earlier, these spaces were just packed to the brim with possessions. And um, the dining table starts to become one of the more expensive uh, items in these inventories. And they would have been made from quite expensive materials, exotic hardwoods like mahogany um, and walnut. So, yeah, absolutely. Things start to change in terms of uh, possessions and function towards the end of the century. Thank you. Uh, one comment before another question from Adrian, who says, thanks, Melanie, I've finished reading your 14 Henrietta Street book and I'm now over halfway through your fantastic best address book. So very interesting. You really bring the street to life. I thoroughly recommend both books. Thank you for your really thorough and fascinating work. It's lovely. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. 
I'm reading an anonymous attendee here talking about cods, the they cod's tongues. That's brilliant. Yeah, so it's, um, for people who can't see that, uh, there's uh, someone who says, I'm from Newfoundland and we eat cod tongues there. We eat them pan fried in a little flour and butter. They're delicious and taste a bit like scallops with the texture of mussels. So cool to know they ate them here in Dublin back then. Oh, that's brilliant. That's amazing. <laughs> and on the subject of food, um, Owen asks, where could he find out more about coddle, spelled C-O-U-D-L-E? Is that the same as the coddle we'd have today? My understanding is it's not the same. You know, the coddle we have today, I don't know, Leonie, are you familiar with this? But it's like boiled sausages and things, and it's not very pleasant. Mm. Um, this coddle uh, is uh, or was um, a hot drink. Sometimes it had alcohol in it, and it was a fortifying mm -hmm. post-labor drink. And um, there is some information about it online. And um, but I am very grateful, as I've mentioned earlier, to Emma O'Toole and um, for sharing mm -hmm. her research and um, into and um, specifically into uh, births and, and the lining in the Irish context. Um, and to say these, it was a fortifying drink, but it was also ceremonial. You know, it would have been served to visiting female guests uh, in these spaces. And we didn't really have time to discuss it, but um, the rituals that went on around the lying in, around childbirth, uh, really, um, for me, fascinating in showing, yeah. again, this sort of blurred boundaries between the private and the public aspects of these women's lives. That they, you know, they give birth and then their friends come in for a visit. I suppose not too yeah. similar to us in normal times. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's a fa fascinating area. And if I don't know if anyone, I've been looking into a bit of food history recently, and if anyone's more interested in food of this period and earlier, Joan Thirsk's book, um, that Food in Early Modern England, Phases, Fads, Fashions, takes you from 1500 up to 1760. And I can tell you there's some weird and wonderful things in there. That sounds brilliant. And one final question, I think, before we wrap up. Um, could you tell us a bit about domestic staff and what it took to run a place like Borton Henrietta Street? Where did the staff reside? Was there garden space or yard space? And was that functional or decorative? Sure. Well, like the women, and actually much more so than the women, and we have hoped to be able to chat a little bit with Leonie about servants tonight. Um, they are really very hidden um, um, people who lived within these houses. We really know very little about specific histories. Um, we can gather from other spaces, from other establishments. But it would have taken approximately about 20 um, servants to staff a townhouse. Um, you know, the Duke of Bedford uh, in London had 40, but you know, that's an extreme case. He paid £12,000 a year just for his staff. Now that's millions you know, in, in modern terms and um, we know there would have been a housekeeper they were paid about 10 pounds per annum which is okay and um, chambermaids and pages received a lot less about three pounds mm -hmm. and then there would be the male servants butlers footmen and um, as well as the governess the ladies maids the valets cooks chefs coachmen um, and grooms etc so huge amounts of staff actually they outnumber the family in the vast majority of cases and um, and although traditionally uh, the story goes that oh they slept up in the you know the, the garrets the attics of these houses, um, actually it seems they slept all over. Um, a lot of inventories uh, contain press beds and fold away beds, often in place like a hall, um, which seems to show that the servants would have slept there at night. And then of course they did sleep in the stables. But this would have been the stable staff, the grooms and the stable boys um, and stable houses. Uh, would have tend to have had um, sleeping areas, and I can say bed chambers in the areas above, they would have been really functional. Um, places like Henrietta Street, uh, Fortune Henrietta Street, would have had um, passageways at the rear or um, little annexes that led from the lower areas of the house in the basement where the um, servants would have done their work, would have carried out the more functional aspects of life. Um, and these communicated with the stables behind, and that would have left the more ornamental garden area for the family to enjoy. They didn't have to see the servants at all. They kept to the back stair, and as I say, open to these underground passageways. 
I mean, in big country houses, it's much easier to see um, some of the designation of spaces for um, servants to inhabit and use and also for productive functions of the household. But yeah, with the urban townhouses, it's, it's more difficult. But my sense is that we're in a bit of a transitional period because, you know, earlier on, if you've gone back to the 17th century, you know, servants are actually quite visible in houses. You know, mm. often your servant sleeps you know, in a truckle bed pulled out from under your bed or maybe in the bed with you, right? If you were a master or a mistress of the house. But by the time we get to the 18th century, obviously we're seeing things like the back stair um, in lots of country houses, especially in Ireland, you see this sunken kind of corridor, outdoor corridor around a house so that if you're looking out over your grounds, you don't see, you know, scullery maids scurrying from one bit of the house to another. So, and then by the 19th century, you know, the idea of the, there's a sort of, sort of cycle there's a psychology to this which is suddenly you have all these people if you're wealthy in the 19th century you have all these people in your house but you aren't supposed to see them so they're there but they're unseen and that leads to all sorts of uh, kind of literary imagination about these sort of ghostly figures in your home um and and that's kind of a trope so I think yeah the period we're talking about tonight is really transitional there's, there's you know dozens of these guys in these elite homes and there is being some attempt being made to separate their them and what they do from these you know elegant social spaces absolutely i just think that it's also important to know though although thinking servants get a bad reputation in contemporary commentary they're untrustworthy committing crimes actually when you look at the physical spaces and the lack of locks because their locks are very expensive, so they would only have been uh, used in places that were absolutely necessary. And the lack of locks in the shared spaces, like the back stair, but also every room in the house was occupied by servants at some point in the day, shows how uh, enmeshed they were with the uh, elite owners and the life of the townhouse. Subject of a whole nother talk entirely, isn't it? We could go go into so much more detail here, um, but I think we'll um, I think we'll wrap up there. So thank you both so much again for a wonderful um, conversation this evening. Um, it's something that um, I think we'd like to um, look at a lot more. Um, you know, exploring the lives of um, these women who would have been the first residents in the building. So. Thank you for um, shedding a bit of light on that this evening. And thank you, everybody, for coming along and watching. Um, and do go and check out the website for um, and take a look at Melanie's book if you're interested. And I hope we see you on other Tea Time Talks in the future. We do have a few other events um, that uh, the Culture Company runs. If you um, are interested, uh, Mondays at the Mess is a series of talks at Richmond Barracks that celebrate the rich stories and experiences of the local community, past and present, um, that's in, in Shakur, and Culture Club, which is a series of hosted talks and tours that encourage people to connect with cultural spaces in the city and the National Neighbourhood as well, which is a year-round programme that creates ways for people to see and make culture in their place. Um, so hopefully some of these things will be happening in person in the not too distant future. But in the meantime, a lot of stuff is online so you can access it from the comfort of your own home. So hopefully we will see you at more events in the future. In the meantime, thank you again, Melanie and Leonie and everybody and have a lovely evening. <laughs>